thought about transcontinental highways and one of them was called the Victory Highway which was US 40 now Interstate 80 and another highway would be the Lincoln Highway which is US 50 which out here in Nevada runs from a point near Great Basin National Park it goes uh, through Ely, Eureka, Austin, Fallon and on into uh, down toward uh, South Lake Tahoe, passing through Carson City, of course. The chief cities uh, on the Lincoln Highway would, are Ely and Fallon and Carson City. Ely began as a settlement in 1885, 1887, when there was a big county seat war in White Pine County among towns like Hamilton and Cherry Creek and others, and we'll be seeing scenes of those. But right, right from the the town of Ely was selected to be the county seat because it was central in the in the county. All the roads seemed to converge there. After its founding in 1885, within a couple of years, uh, there were quite a few businesses along what's known as Murray Creek or Ely. And in the early 1890s, a, um, a courthouse was built and a jail, and behind it would be the privy. Now, Ely began, it began, it began, it began to become a real boom town of itself after 1901, when copper, uh, more rich copper was discovered in the nearby uh, hills and mountain ranges. And by 1907, it was a full-fledged town like this. I mean, it, it grew um, to a town of more than 10,000 people and we played, had the, uh, the, the great Hotel Nevada downtown. Uh, it's, there were suburbs like uh, Wright Town, Ruth, Miguel, and Miguel would be up on the upper right. The, the town uh, was the center of, uh, of all political and, and commercial attention for all of eastern Nevada from the point all the way down from Las Vegas up toward Wells. And the streets back in 1903 were crowded with uh, all kinds of rigs on Murray Street and a similar scene a few years later you would show automobiles going up and down Murray Street. This is a view looking west when the town was just about to experience its copper boom. And here, within about five years, you can see substantial building being built and the, the uh, horse-drawn conveyances were replaced by automobiles. And this is about 1908. And within about five years, the Lincoln Highway was designated going through Central Nevada, known as US 50. And there were guidebooks published about the Lincoln Highway very early. All the little stops along the line from Lincoln Highway back in New York, went to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Northern Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, and on, on the way through. And guidebooks would describe eating places, hotels, lodging, places to see. And the Lincoln Highway book of 1913 describes things to see out of Ely. There would be uh, the Lehman Caves, which is now Great Basin National Park, ghost towns nearby like Cherry Creek, and actually the Lincoln Highway from a point west of Ely went 
through the uh, what's now the ghost town of Hamilton before that the highway was rerouted in the 1920s when more guidebook books would come out. Here's a picture of that early courthouse I showed a few minutes ago with the courthouse, the jail down at the bottom, and then the outhouse on the far left, and the, and the early town of Ely growing up 1888-1899. But with a rich copper boom, the, town, the county was very wealthy and they built a substantial courthouse in 1908. And the pond is still there, although you see the trees are just starting to grow. Now they're all huge, 100 foot high trees and more surrounding the courthouse at Ely, White Pine County. One suburb, suburb was the town of McGill, and early on there was uh, various ethnic factions, Italians, Greeks, uh, Irish, all in different parts of McGill. And up on the hill you can see another suburb. Uh, here is a area view of McGill. The big smelter for copper was built uh, over here on the left, and therefore McGill had a population of 2,500 itself, with a school and substantial buildings and some very wealthy residence areas of McGill. Uh, some of those homes are still there today. Uh, with the labor unrest, uh, the Nevada State Police now known as the Nevada National Guard, came in during a strike um, at Ruth. That was a, mi a mining camp just barely west of Ely, about four or five miles. Trouble with Ruth is, it was established in one place uh, before 1900, and by 1920 it had moved six different times because the copper pits were being enlarged, and since about 1920 it's been in one place about five miles west of Ely, one mile south of the Lincoln Highway, US 50. Another suburb was uh, Ripe Town, or as some of Reap Town, named for John Reap, a local a miner. And this was the red light district for the Ely area, so some people called it Rape Town. But there were about five establishments here in, in Reap Town. And today, uh, not one building is left to show this town site. To uh, give an idea uh, for the area, uh, the town of Ely's right here. We'll be talking about Cherry Creek up here in Shelburne. And the, the Highway 50 starts way over here uh, as it enters Nevada from Utah. Ely, it went into Hamilton at first, then into Eureka and over into Austin. Now, the modern Highway 50 goes much, much further north near Antelope Springs and goes into Eureka that way. But at first, it went it covered through mining camps. The first one north of Ely was Cherry Creek. Cherry Creek began as a silver mining camp in 1872, 1873, and by the mid-1870s, it was a, a town of substantial size. In fact, it vied for the county seat away from that place called Hamilton, west of Ely. But uh, there was a vote to move the county seat in 1882, and in those days, uh, the White Pine County had three county commissioners, and you had to get the vote of two or three of them to move the county seat, or it could be moved by the state legislature. Back, in, back then, there was uh, uh, two commissioner races, and the people of Cherry Creek, uh, of course, in these days, only men voted, uh, was getting uh, registered voters to uh, sign up for, for, uh, the, for the parties so that they could uh, vote on whether to move the county seat. And this would only happen if the, if the three county commissioners or at least two of the three, would vote to move the county seat from Hamilton. Well, in 1882, one commissioner was not up for re-election. He was in favor of moving the county seat to Cherry Creek, this town right here. Then there was the other two elections, 
but only uh, but but the 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 vote came in and there was not enough voters to elect county commissioners friendly to move the county seat and so that idea went uh, lost out and Hamilton kept the county seat but Cherry Creek was still lively and uh, there'd be dances in that big uh, three-story house in back of where those men are in the boroughs and, and you can see they're all dressed up because they these were ranch young men from the ranches they'd come in for the Friday night dance stay all night now early the next morning on Saturday they were on their way back back to the ranches and that's why they're all dressed up besides that when a photographer was on the scene here near the 1880s uh, anyone would want to get into the act especially those two men holding rifles on the left the pie eating contest in Cherry Creek would occur like on uh, the 4th of July weekend in July uh, the idea was to consume the the, the pie uh, they put before you and the one that ate it ate all of it the fastest would would win and of course there was also horse racing and, and uh, uh, tug of wars and the sack con uh, sack uh, running contest uh, on the 4th of July and of course the town band would play patriotic music and maybe a parade uh, inside one of the saloons in Cherry Creek we see uh, the bartender ready for action on the left and the people pausing uh, while they drink for the photographer to take their picture on the floor uh, near the kickstand you can see spittoons a lot of people those those a lot of men in those days chewed tobacco and would spit in those spittoons but it must have been during a holiday time because uh, you can see on the left uh, bunting above the bar just to uh, designate the holiday a town south of, of Ely was Cher it was the town of Taylor and you see it was built on the side of a hill the right hand side of the town is way up there and the left hand side of the town is even though it's just one street is considerably below but you can see the uh, the wagon in the middle of the picture uh, is decorated with flags and this must have been another holiday scene at the town of Taylor Taylor was a big silver mining camp that lasted all from discoveries in the 1870s well into the 20th century and again the flags are blowing in the breeze further east and not too far from US 50 was um, the mining camp of Osceola and there there were lots of placer miners with their pans, sluices, long toms but some were engaged in hydraulic mining hydraulic mining was a feature of California mining for placer gold wearing away the side of the hill as you see here with the high tension nozzles allowing a little bit of water to trickle in of course and then the the uh, uh, exposed ore would be over here there's other pictures of hydraulic mining where there'd be recovery boxes maybe here to get to separate the, the valuable gold from the waste rock at Osceola and it grew to be a town of about 300 people the chief uh, uh, thing left in Osceola now besides the, the general store and a few residences all abandoned is the cemetery at the west end of town it's one of the best preserved cemetery or rural cemeteries in the state another mining camp uh, just off highway 50 or the america's loneliest highway is uh is is a black horse and it's uh about 50 miles east of ely and you see the bar the bartenders are ready for the crowd to come in the usual thing lots of bottles so with liquors of all kinds in the back and pictures of uh, in the back would be pictures of women or uh, birds or or animals adorning the uh, saloon and this is inside of a tent 
You can see the wood framing, keeping up the tent. The canvas would be put over it, and all of a sudden you have an instant building. West of uh, Ely was Hamilton, and this is the ruins of the Wells Fargo office. And even now, there's is uh, ongoing, has undertaken further deterioration. And now about that, that side of the building now is all collapsed. This is early in June, which is a great and delightful time to explore ghost towns in the high country of central and eastern Nevada along Highway 50. Snow is still in the mountains, plenty of it. Hamilton was active from its discoveries in 1868 and until about 1880, 1885. Here's a pack train ready to go out and hunt for the prospector, hunt for ore. This was taken around 1900. Prospector would uh, have his animals uh, loaded up with all kinds of, uh, of uh, foodstuffs, canned goods, um, maybe dynamite, uh, picks and shovels, buckets, and then come out and come back into Hamilton after two weeks of searching for ore. Hamilton looked like this in 1869 during the height of the boom. You see the big hotel on the left, two stories hotel, and a bunch of wooden buildings going all the way down the street. Uh, just the piece over there on the left. It was the county seat. The courthouse is uh, 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 off camera to the left. I was back there in 1969, exactly 100 years later, and note the building on the left, the position of it. Uh, 1969, all buildings left and only one wall left of that hotel. You, this, 100 years ago, there were buildings nearly a mile extending all the way up and down the street. Uh, high up in the next county to the west, Eureka County, this Paiute is looking down on the Humboldt River, which was a mainstay for the uh, immigrant trails, travelers going west beginning in 1849. The, the up north of Eureka, a town we'll be seeing very soon, was the town of Palisades. This is 1910. That Indian was probably perched way up here looking down. The Palisades, named after Palisades of New York, and three railroads came converged on this place called Palisade. The, in, the Central Pacific, the Western Pacific, and the Eureka and Palisade Railroad. And there's still uh, quite a few ruins left there of the school. But back in the boom days, 1870-71, the main street, here's Wells Fargo, the main street is right here. Plenty of wood being discharged from the railroad and would be uh, taken by a uh, horse train or a mule train from Eureka to nearby mining settlements. This picture shows uh, several oxen or bulls right through here and they were used to cart the, uh, the supplies, lumber, uh, maybe even milling and mining machinery to nearby mining camps. Oxen were, were uh, good animals for hauling heavy loads because they were strong, sturdy animals. The, that, that was the advantage of oxen. The disadvantage is that you could probably only make four to five miles a day, whereas a good set of horse team would make 15 to 20 miles a day. So they were sparingly used, but in the Nevada mining camps, they were uh, used uh, when required. Uh, school uh, at Mineral Hill, that's a mining camp about halfway between Palisade near Elko and the town of Eureka. And school days lasted from September till June. And all, all, all in those days of the big mining camp era, 1870 through about 1918, especially around 1900 where this picture was taken, there'd be teams like this going across the desert, wagons loaded with all kinds of, of, um, of uh, supplies for the mining camps, kicking up dust, 
as they go through the deserts. This picture was taken oh, about 30 miles north of Eureka, which is on US 50. In Eureka, the town of Eureka, uh, here is a schooner, and he's, his, uh, his two rigs are all loaded with, uh, with uh, items to be delivered to nearby mining camps. This is uh, uh, an animal team that lasts about 16, 16 animals. The, the swamper, or the driver right there, the teamster, is on the left uh, wheel horse. Uh, right at the tongue of the wagon, always horses were used. They're stronger animals. And maybe further on down the line, there might be uh, either horses uh, as well as, or, or mules. The uh, teamster would have a, a swamper who would generally ride on one of the wagons or inside, and the swamper would take care of the animals at night, and the teamster would sort of relax after a day of driving his animals. All the animals were driven by a long line uh, uh, team with a, with a, with a uh, rod or a chain running all the way to the wheel horses or the wheel animals. Command of Guy and Howe would make the team and the wagons go left and right as they went down the trail. Here is another team, but this time they're hauling, hauling uh, something in the Eureka that was absolute necessity to run these smelters, which exist at the north and south end of town of Eureka. And that would be uh, sacks of, of uh, charcoal. A little bit later on I'll be showing you a picture of a charcoal oven. But basically, the charcoal was manufactured in, in ovens, beehive shape, put pinion pine wood inside. Uh, there's a couple of iron, one iron door and one iron window. Close those down, uh, light the fire, let the, let the wood simmer and create charcoal, which was an agent in, in the ore reduction of lead and silver ore at the Eureka smelters. And the ruins of those smelters in Eureka can still be seen today. Here's uh, one at the south end of town called the Richmond. And you can see what big manufacturing plants they were. Uh, imagine the pollution for the town. And the town is over here on the left. This is the Richmond Consolidated. And then at the north end of town was the Eureka Consolidated. Uh, massive plants. These cost back in the boom days, about a quarter of a million dollars to build. Here, uh, the, the plant is right here in plenty of stacks. One elongated stack goes up the side of the hill and up and tries to discharge the uh, smoke into the next valley. Uh, here's a local delivery wagon. Uh, this, this wagon was not meant to go from town to town but just used to uh, take boxes off the train, which was coming into Eureka, and uh, to deliver around to local merchants, whatever they were ordering. And Eureka had a suburb called Ruby Hill, and this was a mining camp of a couple of thousand people around 1880. It had its own newspaper, churches, a distinct town from Eureka. And here is some of the wood being hauled in uh, by mules, small horses, where uh, the wood was being hauled to the, to the um, charcoal kilns for the, for the purpose of making charcoal. And uh, if you go around Eureka today, the whole area, 20, 30 miles from north and south, is still denuded of trees. There, some have grown back, of course, but they, these trees were robbed of, of their, uh, and cut down all the time to feed into these charcoal, either charcoal pits or charcoal kilns. There's a picture of a kiln itself, and you see the, the, this man is actually loading <coughs> uh, wood into the kiln as soon as the wood got filled about halfway, it had to be stoked in from the top. You close everything down, and uh, then then allow the wood to simmer for at least 
10 days to two weeks to make charcoal. So this is the story of the Lincoln Highway from eastern Nevada through uh, past Great Nation National Park, Ely, and into Eureka. Uh, the Lincoln Highway actually went further west through Austin and um, through uh, Fallon and into western Nevada. The Lincoln Highway was established in 1913 across America, and it ran through central Nevada, and it was by far the preferred route to get from a point near Salt Lake City to uh, western Nevada, more so than, than US 40, which was along the Humboldt River through Elko and Winnemucca and Reno. Uh, of course, nowadays, that's Interstate 80, and it's traveled by far, far more cars and trucks than the Lincoln Highway of today, which runs through Austin, or which runs through Ely, Eureka, Austin, Fallon, Dayton, and into Carson City and on uh, over into California. I suppose that uh, on a given day, Interstate 80 s sees more traffic than this road sees in nine or 10 days. In the old days of Dayton, before the Lincoln Highway, Holly, the Chinese peddler, would go from Dayton and walk up Gold Canyon, almost 11 miles, uh, to Gold Hill and Silver City and Virginia City. Maybe not make it all the way, selling things from those two baskets. You can see the baskets uh, are, are, are filled with them. Um, vegetables, uh, foodstuffs that were grown in Dayton. <clears throat> and he would, uh, of course, the, light, the load was light going uphill with just th those things. And he would hike up there and trade with the merchants of Silver City and Gold Hill, Virginia City, and sell the stuff, and then bring back things that people ordered uh, from Virginia City, from the big stores there, for the people of Dayton. So he, he uh, commanded a two-way haul and served a useful function between Dayton and Virginia City. Uh, way back during the building of the Sutro Tunnel, which is a tunnel built from Virginia City five miles eastward toward, uh, well, in the, in the direction of uh, Six Mile Canyon, the, silver, the, the Sutro Tunnel served the function of um, draining the mines of Virginia City after its completion in 1878, and also providing ventilation. Well, here's the, an occasion where a photographer came and caught these miners. And of course, they're, they're showing their very best. This picture was taken by 1882. And uh, the big Sutro Tunnel caught the imagination of national newspapers after one year after its completion. This is from a paper in January of 1879. And these miners with their lamps are actually uh, in the Sutro Tunnel area. And the Sutro Tunnel lasted until it started to cave in in the 20th century. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Carson City as it looked uh, just before the 20th century began. And lots of mud on the streets. Uh, uh, this is the day. This is before automobiles, so you see, nothing, there's a couple of of uh, wagons and horses <clears throat> looking north. But Carson City grew fast in the early 20th century because Nevada became quite populated, and the Virginia Truckee Railroad ran through Carson City beginning with its completion in 1869 until 1950. And. Uh, Here's the picture of the Carson City train, uh, the Virginia City, the Virginia Truckee Railroad train on North Carson Street at the point near the U.S. Mint. And the train is, is going side, uh, is uh, perpendicular to Carson Street. And uh, the trees, of course, that were planted and grew very big in front of the Mint have all been torn down now. But the VT Railroad, uh, was uh, brought in passengers and freight in from the main line 
uh, Western Pacific and Union Pacific Railroad at Reno, southward to Carson City, and then the Virginia Truckee Railroad ran east along the Carson River and up north toward toward the, and terminated Virginia City. Uh, one distinguished gentleman, a man named Theodore Roosevelt, uh, came through uh, Virginia Carson City in 1913. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the shops in Carson City where where trains were uh, uh, repaired, uh, serviced. You can see here a locomotive. Here's the front end headlight. It's all torn apart to be um, restructured and uh, re repaired. Uh, the engine parts would wear out. When when Theodore Roosevelt came in 1913, the town decorated uh, all of its building with bunting. Here's the big uh, state building. Uh, it's still there today. Uh, Roosevelt uh, left California uh, and then got into Reno uh, one night and early next morning took the Virginia Turkey Railroad, came into Carson City and went from past this uh, this uh, state building and over toward uh, uh, toward the state capitol. Here the, the trains are smoking in, the bells are ringing, the cr there's crowds over on the side, they're all cheering for the train coming in, knowing that Teddy Roosevelt, ex-president, was on the, plan and on the train. Uh, here's the entrance to the state capitol, there's all kinds of swords and, and uh, staffs all around Teddy Roosevelt speaking. Uh, about five years after he left the presidency. Uh, further west from Carson City along Lake Tahoe, Glenbrook uh, was a large milling center for the, uh, for the cutting of timber uh, and make wood for transport for use in Carson City and Virginia City. Glenbrook today is now a fashionable re residential area. Uh, one can get their bearings by that, that huge cliff over there on the right, but there used to be three sawmills along the, along the east shore of Lake Tahoe there at Glenbrook. Uh, here's the first one by Captain Prey, built in 1861, and it lasted until larger, more efficient ones were built, more efficient ones were built in the 1870s. The uh, problem of getting wood from these sawmills at Renbrook into Carson City was a big one. And so uh, the milling companies built uh, a small railroad, a narrow gauge called the Glenbrook Railroad, and it ran from Glenbrook, uh, and, and, and there were switchbacks coming all the way up to Spooner Summit, which is on US 50. That's the summit for between Carson Valley and Lake Tahoe. And uh, that railroad lasted for about not quite 25 years, hauling the wood and timber, lumber up uh, over that summit and down uh, to the summit where it was discharged into flumes. And there's no picture of flume here, but a good picture of the lower track going this way, the switchback like this, and there's the track going back up towards Turner Summit. The all along Highway 50, uh, there are ghost towns and things to see. Uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier about the town of Hamilton. Uh, after about World War II, it was deserted entirely, and residents were just left here with all the wood scattered about, houses wrecked in the town of Hamilton. High above Hamilton was Treasure City, where the mines were. And Wells Fargo and company came in there early and built the bank at an altitude of 8,700 8, feet. And most, much of this building is still there today. But the, it was actually a folly to build a bank way up there uh, above Hamilton, because Hamilton was the county seat and the commercial center whereas Treasure City is where the mines were, and of course had commercial buildings, and so Wells Fargo only stayed in that building one year 
then it became a mercantile store. Another picture of the Wells Fargo Bank building from the inside looking out. <clears throat> the ruins abound way up there at Treasure City, three miles above Hamilton. Uh, ruins of mines. There's just acres and acres of mines. They, they extend for about three miles. Another commercial building in Treasure City. This one was a uh, uh, store of general merchandise. It's almost directly across from the Wells Fargo building. And another suburb of Hamilton is called Eberhardt. And here's the ruins of a mill. You can see where at the top, of the, there used to be a three-story mill right here. At the top would be an area where, uh, where ores discharged, and there were stamps to crush the ore right here. And then it was brought down further into the mill where uh, ore was processed and captured with the use of mercury. Another view of uh, another mill there in that same area. Unfortunately, all this timbering here uh, uh, succumbed to a fire just two years ago when a fire in Eberhardt Canyon skipped along and, and just burnt what it, what it could. And, but the Forest Service had let the fire just burn out because there was nothing, no one was, lives in the area today anyway. Way up there on the, on the same mountaintop, someone built a nice wood frame building like this. Who knows of its story? Who knows? No one knows when it was built. Or, and it, it's still in existence. It's just too remote for anyone to haul anything away from it. The Lincoln Highway, which was established in 1913 and is still an ongoing highway. Uh, in fact, there's a Lincoln Highway Association. That, that's dedicated to preserving the highway, was uh, started to get some pavement as early as uh, just after World War I. Here's a scene of the Lincoln Highway north of Ely. And uh, going past the Shelburne Ranch, this is uh, about 40 miles north of Ely. A beautiful ranch with lots of shade trees, as you see here. <coughs> You have to ask the owner's permission to visit in order to explore this part of the highway. And east of Ely, uh, some segments like this are, are just simply reduced back to, to um, gravel and, and mud highway, uh, abandoned, not much used anymore. But it, it used to go by buildings like this, north of Ely. Good specimens of the Lincoln Highway still exist north of Ely. And they go past a place called Tippett. And Tippett seems to make even the modern maps, but it's, it's abandoned, as you see here. There used to be a service station here, a full-scale motel, or they, in those days called them auto courts, and a gasoline pumps and so forth, all removed at Tippett, which is about 50 miles northeast of Ely. And here's the par parting of the ways here. The, the uh, modern highway, the modern gravel road goes to the left, but the Lincoln Highway goes straight to center east in the direction of Utah. And I went out exploring it uh, about uh, six years ago. And uh, Carl got muddy. But that's, the, that's just part of the, the whole idea of getting out and exploring. You don't worry about how clean your car is. Uh, further east toward 8 Mile, uh, on the Utah border, about 60 miles northeast of Ely, uh, wood cabins are still out there for a person to enjoy and take pictures of. These are all on private ranches nowadays. And once you get in over into Utah, the, the Lincoln Highway, the old highway, is paved again. And there are monuments and so forth, as you see here, uh, dedicated to not only the Lincoln Highway, but the Pony Express, the Overland Mail uh, route, of, which is the old Lincoln Highway. Old barns and so forth that exist along that highway. As the Lincoln Highway leaves Ely, Eureka, and gets into Austin, 
you first meet, uh, it's Lincoln Highway passes by the rural Ridley General Store. And here, a new roof was put on it to preserve the building. Rural Gridley was the mayor of Austin. And uh, there, in, he was instrumental in, in uh, building, to establishing the sanitary fund in Ely, the forerunner in Austin, the forerunner to the, uh, to the Red Cross of today. And Rural Gridley lost a uh, bet on, 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 on a political race, and he had to carry a sack from Lower Austin up to Upper Austin. Here's a, a picture of uh, one of the stores at Eureka. Uh, it's a delightful town to visit today. Uh, courthouse, many substantial buildings. Here, uh, <coughs> the courthouse was built in 1879. And it's just, just interesting going in and seeing the old courtroom. And you're allowed to roam the building. Another shot of the uh, uh, Rural Gridley General Store. And there's other ruins along the way, like this old uh, Pony Express station near Austin. And I took this picture about eight years ago, and even since then, the, the building shows further deterioration. Or from north of e Eureka, you can travel the old Eurekan Palisade Railroad, ran to that mining camp called Palisade I told you about earlier, and just let your mind roam free and just enjoy the, the desert air and the sunshine. And this is an old station house along the line of the Eurekan Palisade Railroad. And uh, the Lincoln Highway uh, Association is keeping alive uh, and preserving the history of the Lincoln Highway all the way from New York to California and they put out uh, guidebooks to every state and it's worthwhile buying one of them for Nevada and enjoying uh, the, the sites along the Lincoln Highway uh, the, 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 the organization dedicated to preserving its history and through these guidebooks, and they do so most admirably. Lake Tahoe, the jewel of the Sierra, is the most beautiful place in the world. Nature's wonderland, surrounded by majestic mountains above and beautiful sapphire blue waters below that splash upon the 72 miles of shoreline at a depth of 1,645 feet. Waterfalls are plentiful with their dramatic beauty as they splash against the granite rocks below. 63 different streams flow into the lake. Tahoe is an excellent destination for a variety of visitors. There's something for everyone. Nature's playground with trails that take you deep into our gorgeous forests and pristine alpine lakes surrounded by meadows with wildflowers. Hiking and exploring nature's wonderland is an experience you'll never forget. The peaceful energy that flows through your body when you walk in the forest and the healing sights and sounds of nature refresh your mind and soul. Come with us on an adventure to treasure. Pick your favorite hike. will show you what you will need to make your hiking adventure more pleasurable. You'll need a backpack, wilderness permits when required, a compass, this one has a whistle, a map of the area, mosquito repellent is a must, sunscreen, good hiking boots and socks, You'll have to take our word for those. A first aid kit. Lots of water. You can never carry too much water. 
a camera. This is Tahoe, after all, and there will be lots of pictures you won't want to miss. Snacks and your picnic lunch, if you're planning on having one, because I'm not sharing mine. A fishing pole and tackle, if you're planning on catching fish for dinner. A rain poncho is always a good idea. The weather can change rapidly in the Sierra. And you can leave your cell phone at home. Just kidding, they can be helpful in times of emergencies. The hike to Fallen Leaf Lake is a perfect hike for anyone. You walk along Taylor Creek where the kokanee salmon spawn in the fall, through meadows lined with aspens singing in the wind, dazzling you with their changing colors in the fall, fields of wildflowers and views of Mount Talak, then the splendor of Fallen Leaf Lake surrounded by the majestic mountains, sometimes capped with snow that sits atop their peaks like crowns. To get there, Travel approximately three miles from the Y on Highway 89 North. You turn left on Cathedral Road, just past the Taylor Creek Bridge. Travel about a half mile up the road to a turnout on the left. Park in this dirt pullout and start your hike at the fence. Just a few yards straight ahead, you come to this magnificent spot at Taylor Creek. The dog really enjoys the swim. Did you see that fish jump? The kokanee salmon spawn here every fall. It's quite a sight to see the water turn red with salmon. The fall colors are fantastic with all the aspens. Therefore, this is a must hike in the fall. Here's proof that there are beavers here, and recently it seems. Are they trying to alter the course of Taylor Creek? Just like they say, busy as a beaver. The trail splits here. You can go to your right and continue through the beautiful meadow or veer to the left and the trail will take you alongside Taylor Creek. These options work out great because you can make a loop and enjoy both trails. We will go through the meadow and come back along the creek. The meadow is abundant with wildflowers and aspen trees and you have these fantastic views of Mount Talak. The Indians say that when all the snow melts in the cross on Mount Talak, it'll be three weeks until the first snowfall. Now once we go down this hill, we're back at Taylor Creek. As you can see, you can't keep the Labradors out of the water. As soon as Dallas is finished with her swim, we start back on the trail. The trail to the right will take you on a longer hike to Sawmill Cove, where you can enjoy a picnic. If you go to your left, you will cross the bridge. Look, there's someone enjoying the clear blue waters of Fallen Leaf Lake. We continue down the trail for a short distance until we reach the beach. Take your choice. There are many different things to enjoy at Fallen Leaf Lake. You can always spot a fishing boat or water skiers on the lake. This is a great place to spend an afternoon, have a picnic, or take a refreshing swim in the lake. The surroundings are pleasant to the eye with Mount Talak standing there so strong, beckoning you to come climb me, experience my unbelievable views. The Valhalla Estates hike is easily accessible to anyone. This is a marvelous hike filled with Tahoe's early 1900s history. Strolling through the lovely grounds at the estates with views of Lake Tahoe framed by the sandy beaches that beckon you to come play, sit, relax, enjoy. To get there, travel approximately three miles from the Y on Highway 89. Turn right at the entrance to the historic site sign continue on to the parking lot. This hike is for everyone, even the physically challenged. The podiums are filled with interesting history about the area. The trails lead you to the wonderful beaches where you can enjoy the water like Dallas or just stroll along the shore of beautiful Lake Tahoe. The Lake of the Sky Trail runs adjacent to the beach. Boating is always a favorite on the lake. Over at Camp Richardson Resort you can rent kayaks, paddle boats and other items. The entrance to the estates is traveled in many different ways, as you can see. This first estate is the Baldwin Estate, and right next to it are the wildflower gardens that have been restored. A stroll through the gardens gives you a closer look at the flowers.
Just beyond the gate is the pond area at the Pope Estate. Rustic benches in the gazebo at one end make this area storybook gorgeous. Go ahead, toss a coin in the pond, make a wish. The Pope Estate and this wonderful view of Lake Tahoe make for a perfect paradise. The honeymoon cottage plays so perfectly in this setting. Who would not have wanted to stay here? The last estate is the Heller, or more commonly known as Valhalla Estate, set so perfectly with the grounds framing the beauty. Many events take place here in the summer. Can you just imagine your checkered tablecloth on the grass and your picnic basket setting right here? In the early 1900s, this was definitely the place to be. What a perfect way to enjoy a summer afternoon. The Rainbow Trail is a marvelous hike where you can stroll around and soak in all the beauty while getting nature's education from all the informative podiums along the trail. This trail is also accessible by wheelchair and takes you to the profile chamber where you can observe the fish in their natural environment. I would recommend this outing for anyone and everyone. To get there, travel three miles on Highway 89 from the Y until you see a visitor center sign on your right. Turn right and enter the parking lot. The center offers an abundance of information. You can also get your overnight pass for backpacking at the center. Several different trails start from here. The Rainbow Trail starts just beyond the Visitor Center. Just a short distance down the trail and we come to the lookout platform. The views of the meadow and the lake with the mountains framing nature's picture are just gorgeous. This meadow is a nesting area for our wild bird life. Keep your eyes peeled and you just don't know what you might see. Down at the bottom of this hill, the trail meanders through some beautiful aspen groves. Michelle and Morgan take a minute to sit and enjoy nature. All along the trail are these informative podiums. Notice the bald eagle nesting sign. If we're lucky, we might see one, so keep your eyes open. The trail takes you to Taylor Creek where the kokanee salmon spawn every fall. Look at the names carved on these aspen trees. Some date way back. As you can see, this is a very popular trail. As we mentioned earlier, it is accessible to anyone, even the handicapped. At the bridge, the colorful podiums offer information about the wildlife. Just beyond the bridge is the highlight of our adventure, the profile chamber. Inside, you can observe the fish in their own environment. The walls are beautifully painted with scenes of the area in all of the different seasons. Leaving the chamber and taking the trail to the right along the bike path, we can go over and view Taylor Creek from the bridge. On our way back, we stop at the last podium that tells us about Mount Talak that stands at an elevation of 9,735 feet and beckons us to conquer her. And conquer her we will, but you'll have to wait for that terrific hike. These handicap facilities at the Carson River in Hope Valley are so special we could not wait to share them with you. To get there, take Highway 89 at Myers to Pickett's Junction in Hope Valley. At the stop sign, turn right on Highway 88, travel a few hundred feet, and turn into the parking lot on your right. This is all handicap accessible with the most wonderful fishing platforms. I don't know what genius thought this plan up, but I'm impressed with these facilities. We start at the parking lot. The trail is less than a half mile long and is paved all the way down to the river. Hope Valley is breathtaking with the majestic mountains encircling it. Soon we see a sign that will lead us to the fishing platforms. Make a left at the second sign and continue down to the river. Just ahead are two fishing platforms that allow anyone access to the river. What a wonderful idea. The fall colors in Hope Valley are a delight to the camera's eye, so if you're in the area in the fall, this is a must. Michaela and Morgan relax and enjoy nature's beauty. Michelle tries her luck on the first platform. Even if you don't catch a fish, you can't beat the scenery. Bring a picnic and just enjoy the marvelous views from Hope Valley and the Carson River.